Hello, today we're going to be talking about Gothic painting. And again, uh, I'm using the term Gothic here to mean a kind of period of time rather than an identifiable style because the style changes quite a lot during the Gothic period. Uh, we're going to be talking about individual artists more today. Uh, and this is partly because the role of the artist changes during this time. The great artists involved with building the, the cathedrals uh, the sculptors and the painters, they were mainly anonymous. We really don't know most of the people who did that work because at the time uh, the artist was considered mainly a skilled tradesman, you know, someone who worked with his hands. As we move closer into the Renaissance, which is what we are doing in the late Gothic, um, the role of the artist changes so that they begin to be considered not just for the skills of their hands, but for their artistic creative vision, right? They start to be regarded kind of as the, as the great poets are regarded. So a very skilled artist is, is really well respected. Um, the first one I want to talk about is Giotto. Giotto was a pivotal painter, uh, considered by some an early Renaissance painter, but he's definitely working in the Gothic period. He's born, I think, about 1290. Most skilled artists were working as illuminators at the time. And of course, Giotto was paying attention to these. Now, he was the student of another painter uh, named Cimabue. Look at Cimabue and how very, very similar it is to Byzantine icon. So it very much resembles a Byzantine icon. Flat, gold background. The space is very flat. The figures of the angels look like playing cards kind of stacked up over one another. Uh, they don't look like they're occupying a real space. We have a little bit of a hint of perspective uh, projecting out just a little bit from the picture plane, very shallow. Um, and we look at another one very, very similar to that by Giotto, and we see much the same thing, but we also see more of a tendency toward gently sculpting these, these figures and these forms with light and shadow so that the fabric that they're wearing appears to be kind of three-dimensional. We see that uh, pretty notably in uh, Mary's gown that is uh, falling over her knees there, and how the folds are very gentle and soft like fabric would be compared to what we saw with uh, Chimabu. So this is that greater naturalism that we've been talking about all through the Gothic age, more and more naturalism. But we see not only greater naturalism, you know, paying attention to how things really appear, but we see greater humanism. So, whereas the Byzantine art was characterized by this uh, very pronounced spirituality and symbolism, and also a, a very purposeful uh, avoidance of emotion. When you look at Byzantine icons, their faces all have this sort of uniformly blank look, and I think that's because they found trying to portray emotion, strong emotion, kind of distracting, uh, because people might have different res emotional responses to different situations. What was important is what was happening and who that person was, not how they may or may not have felt, or how you should feel. So emotion is sort of taken out of Byzantine art. With the beginning of this greater humanism in art, we see a, a concern now for how people must have felt. They're really working not only by using realism and naturalism, but by portraying emotion. They really are trying to pull the viewer into the situation and get them to respond in an emotional way. Uh, this is a, a very new sort of approach. He puts them in a space, it's an outdoor space, uh, with a sky beyond. And we also see something that's very strange. People in the picture who we can't identify, they're, they're not, uh, their faces are not shown, their backs are to us. And a painter just a little while before would have seen this as being very odd. Why would you put someone in a painting who you couldn't identify? Why would you have their back to the viewer? But this is again Giotto trying to put you in the situation as if you've walked upon this group of people mourning for Christ. Uh, so in a real situation, you probably would see some people with their backs to you that you couldn't identify. Um, he also has in that crowd of people, like he did in his uh, painting of the Madonna we just looked at, uh, 
they're overlapping to the extent that some faces are just blocked out in the crowd. Um, and again, this is like being in a crowd. You don't see everyone's face clearly. So Giotto is making some choices here. He wants that emotional impact much more than he wants clear information. Um, so this is, this is that trend toward humanism. And humanism just means uh, relating to our human experience of things. We'll see this later in depictions of Christ as his figure becomes more human also, an emphasis more on his human nature than on his divine nature. Uh, both perfectly legitimate, but a change in focus, and this is important. So moving on from Giotto, who's such a pivotal character, we have painters like uh, Robert Campen. Now, these are moving, we're up in the North Countries now, in Flanders, in Belgium and Holland, Northern Germany. And this era of Gothic painting, which is later, uh, I think Robert Campen is born in 1370 or so. He also has been watching these amazing developments in uh, illuminated manuscript, along with all these other artists. He also is moving toward greater humanism, inspired by artists like Giotto. So Robert Campen develops a style that focuses so much on the heightened detail. It's an obsessive kind of detail. And I think this comes again from the background of uh, illumination, of these illumination painters, uh, because they're working in miniature. And we see that carrying over then to panel painting. So these artists are working on wood panel, uh, often a single panel, but very often two double panels or diptychs, or triple panels, uh, three, which are called triptychs. And these were often altarpieces. Uh, they might be small portable altarpieces uh, for private homes or chapels, or they might be very large altarpieces for churches. These artists carry with them this love of minute detail, carried to just the farthest extremes. This is that, you know, part of, again, of that uh, increased naturalism and humanism. You know, how do we really experience things? So Robert Campen, you see in his work, it also kind of resembles a uh, Byzantine icon in the beginning, very flat background, but then gradually he adds uh, a believable background and even begins to work in uh, a good deal of perspective. You can see in this uh, triptych that he doesn't quite master it yet. Uh, this is still something that hasn't been worked out mathematically or geometrically, but the artists are making better and better guesses about how it works. But you can see his is a little off in, in a few different ways in these panels. A student of Robert Campen's, possibly, they're not certain, uh, was Jan van Eyck. And Jan van Eyck goes even further. Jan van Eyck is a master painter. In fact, he is probably the greatest painter to live during that period. I, I would put him in the same class as Michelangelo or Leonardo. And he took this, I think, as far as you could take panel painting. And one thing he does is he perfects a, uh, a method of painting in oil paints, layering translucent or transparent glazes of color on top of one another in a way that mimics real color and real textures so vividly that uh, people were simply astonished. They couldn't believe they were looking at a painting because when he painted something, it really looked like glass or metal or carpet or plaster or whatever he was painting, flesh. Uh, Again, he took this to a, a level that uh, people could hardly believe. And because he develops this new approach to oil painting, he's an influence on every painter after that for a long time. And in fact, the great Renaissance painters, uh, Leonardo, Raphael, Titian, all take this idea of oil painting from Jan van Eyck. He is the pioneer that brings this to the world. So we've moved from fresco painting to oil painting as being the primary way that artists work. Um, they had been working in uh, tempera, and when panel painting started, they continued to work in egg tempera. So this is uh, paints mixed with egg and water or different substances. And if you've ever tried to scrape egg off a plate, you know how tough it is. It was a pretty good medium, but it dried fairly quickly. Oil paints did not dry very quickly. 
Uh, so they could be manipulated for a long time. You could do some very, very subtle shading with oil paint that you couldn't do with the tempera. So uh, this new method of oil painting becomes a huge influence on painters ever after. Uh, we had other painters that were also uh, part of this tradition, born about the same time as Jan van Eyck or Robert Camp and Roger van der Weeden is another who's well known for this uh, extremely realistic uh, layered glazing. So during the Gothic period, <clears throat> a few things happen. We move from tempera paint into oil painting techniques and this now dominates. We move for, again, just like in sculpture, we move from uh, a more flat sort of Byzantine spiritual symbolic style to something that is much more natural. So greater naturalism and realism in painting. And we also move toward what they call humanism, recording emotions, trying to evoke emotions in the viewer. So uh, a lot of development in Gothic painting, uh, a lot of great artists to look at. And I hope you will uh, go and find some more of these artists' work and try to look at it very closely. Jan van Eyck in particular is unbelievable. So we'll have a test coming up on the Gothic period soon. These videos along with the, the study guide that you should have, I'll uh, post it again if uh, someone doesn't have it. Uh, these videos will be a part of your review for the unit. So spend some time going back looking over them. They're really not that long. Take some notes. Make note of these very important developments in each one and be ready to test, I would say, next week. So, God bless you all. Have a good day. I'll talk to you soon.